Hello friends, welcome back to another episode of the William Bonney podcast and as promised we're kicking off a new season with profiling one of the country's most notorious and heinous prisons. Um, we're talking about Wakefield today, better known as Monster Mansion um, because it houses some of the most despicable criminals that the UK has to offer. A lot of these guys will not be seeing the light of day again. Um, it's a bit unique uh, as a prison because it doesn't separate anybody there's no protection wing um, so you've got some of the country's worst child killers child molesters rapists murderers and all sorts just all thrown into one wing altogether so today like i say as promised let's kick off the new season with profiling hmp wakefield or better known as monster mansion now a little bit of the history of wakefield prison um, it was originally built as a house of correction in 1594. Most of the current prison buildings uh, date back to the Victorian era. The current prison was designed as a dispersal prison in 1967, holding only 144 inmates, and is the oldest of the dispersal prisons still operating across England and Wales. During the First World War, Wakefield Prison was used as a home office work camp. The ordinary criminal prisoners were removed, and the new influx was sentenced to two or more years imprisonment for refusing to obey military orders. After the closure of Dice Work Camp in October 1916, Wakefield Prison was also used to intern the conscientious objectors to the war. In September 1918, a group of conscientious objectors took advantage of a slackening in the prison regime that occurs towards the end of any war um, by rebelling and refusing to undertake any work. They issued a list of demands for better treatment, known as the Wakefield Manifesto. As a high security prison, Wakefield was used to house IRA prisoners intermittently during the 20th century. In some cases in the 1950s, the IRA attempted to free the prisoners, such as Cathal Golding in 1956, which the attempt was aborted as the alarms sounded, and James Andrew Mary Murphy in 1950, who actually got out. During a hunger strike by the provisional IRA prisoners, Frank Stagg died in Wakefield Prison on the 12th of February 1976. The case brought international media attention as the Irish government denied Stagg's last request for a military funeral march from Dublin to Ballina and instead arranged for the Irish police to bury him secretly. On March the 1st, 1976, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland in the Wilson Ministry announced that those people convicted of causing terrorist offences would no longer be entitled to the special category status, which was challenged during the later hunger strikes. In recent history, in 2001, it was announced that the new ultra-secure unit was to be built at Wakefield Prison. The unit was to house the most dangerous inmates within the British prison system and was the first of such unit of its kind to be built in the United Kingdom. In March 2004, an inspection report from Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons criticised staff at Wakefield for being disrespectful to inmates. The report claimed that the prison was over-controlled and a third of the prison inmates claimed to have been victimised. Wakefield holds approximately 600 of the country's most dangerous people, mainly sex offenders, murderers and prisoners serving life sentences. Accommodation at the prison comprises of single occupancy cells with internal sanitation. All residential units have kitchens available for the offenders to prepare their own meals. An incentives and earned privileges system allows standard and enhanced offenders the opportunity of an in-cell TV. Like other HM prisoners, all offenders are subject to mandatory drug testing and there are voluntary testing arrangements as well which are compulsory for all offenders employed, for example, as wing cleaners or uh, kitchen workers. HMP Wakefield offers a range of activities for inmates, including charity work, an accredited course for an industrial cleaning, and a braille shop where offenders convert books into braille. The education department is operated by the Manchester College and offers a learning opportunity ranging from basic skills to open university courses. Other facilities include the prison shop, gym and a multi-faith chaplaincy. 
A prison inspection in 2018 found that Wakefield Prison was on the whole calm, secure, decent and well managed. Still, prisoners needing psychiatric care face unacceptable delays before they are transferred to a secure psychiatric hospital and prisoners' mental condition worsens while they are waiting for transfer. Peter Clark said, Because of the totally unacceptable delays in doing so, many prisoners across the prison estate are held in conditions that are not in any way therapeutic and indeed many cases clearly exacerbate their condition. The situation at Wakefield was yet another example of where prisoners with severe illnesses not receiving the care that they needed. Inspectors noted a prisoner who was exceptionally challenging to manage had complex needs that could not be met by the prison, while staff attempted to manage him positively and constructively. Now, Wakefield Prison today is Europe's biggest maximum security prison. Nobody has ever escaped since it's become a Category A prison. Um, It has several wings, A, B, C, D. Um, E must be possibly the hospital wing, because F wing is the punishment block. Now, down at the punishment block, you have to be pretty bad to get yourself down there. Um, There are a couple of guys, obviously, who notoriously spend a lot of time down there, um, one of them being Mr. Charles Bronson. Now, there is a downstairs to F wing, where there are two cells underground um, with perspex perspex doors. Now, these perspex doors are very, very similar to what you'll see in the Silence of the Lambs films when they go in and visit the cannibal. And some people say that the um, perspex cells in that film were inspired by the plastic-built cells in HMP Wakefield. It's almost a you know a punishment block within a punishment block. Um, one of the chaps down there, other than Bronson himself, was a guy called Robert Maudsley, who is one of the UK's most notorious criminals. So Robert Maudsley is often referred to as Britain's most dangerous prisoner. Um, he killed his first victim when he was aged just 21, but went on to kill three more in prison. Now these Three inmates that he killed were all sex offenders. Um, he uh, he boasted to the member of staff while he was at Wakefield that he wanted to kill more, but he could only get his hands on those. In 1977, Morsley carried out a brutal murder after barricading himself into a cell with a convicted child molester, David Francis, along with fellow inmate David Cheeseman. Morsley butchered Francis. Over the course of the barbaric nine-hour attack, Maudsley tortured Francis by ramming a spoon in through his ear. The mutilation earned Maudsley the nickname Hannibal the Cannibal. This was because when they went into the cell, the the spoon was still hanging out of his head um, and his brains were all over the floor. So they thought, or rumours started to spread, that Maudsley had eaten some of the victim. But there was no evidence to say that. It was just the, uh, you know, how the rumour started to get around. He's now said to live in the glass box underneath the prison and will be kept in solitary confinement for the rest of his days. He's in his 70s now, and he's spent a long, long time in prison. But, uh, yeah, he's not a guy that you want to be kept uh, kept in the room with. Um, the staff at Wakefield say he enjoys murdering people. They don't think he'll ever get out. Now, one of the more recent inmates that's been housed at uh, Wakefield, Reynard Sinegar was sent to HMP Wakefield in 2020 after raping up to 200 men. The Leeds University student drugged countless victims after luring them back to his Manchester City Centre flat. He's been labelled Britain's worst rapist for his sordid crimes, with police officers calling him a psychopath. Not only did he rape his victims, but he also covertly filmed his disgusting crimes as the men he re-preyed on lay unconscious in his flat. Another one of the... uh, Worst people serving a life sentence down at Wakefield is a chap called Jeremy Bamba. Um, He's currently serving a life sentence after killing his own family members. The former little chef, waiter, killed his adoptive parents, Neville and June, his sister, Sheila, and their twin sons, Daniel and Nicholas, in a cold-blooded attack in 1985. Since his incarceration at HMP Wakefield, he's helped other prisoners to read and write, and has even transcripted a number of books into Braille which has led him to winning awards. For a long time, he um, 
was appealing his sentence, saying that it wasn't him that did it. Um, he was using the fact that some of the police statements, while Bamba was stood outside, some of the police were saying that they could still see somebody inside and that his sister was still alive while he was outside with the police. The police were saying that his sister, they could see his sister and things, but none of his appeals ever came to anything. Um, a lot of people say that he was just clutching at straws. You know, when you're serving a life sentence and all you've got to do is sometimes just pick at the little fibers in people's statements to try and find something to get yourself out. A lot of people say that he is guilty of sin, um, but was just doing his best to try and uh, try and find a way of getting out. But he's another one, won't be ever getting out. Another one of Wakefield's sick prisoners is a chap called Mark Bridger. He killed and abducted April Jones. Nine-year-old April Jones was abducted and murdered by Mark Bridger in 2002. The sick killer initially claimed that he had accidentally run over the young girl and he said he couldn't remember disposing of the body. The judge saw through this and sentenced him to life, calling him a pathological and glib liar. A paedophile, he called him. Bridger was attacked by another inmate in HMP Wakefield in 2013 who slashed him from temple to chin in an attempt to get him to tell the world where April's body was hidden. Another one of the more famous people um, to have passed through uh, HMP Wakefield, and he ended his life in HMP Wakefield, um, known to his acquaintances as Fred Shipman. Um, Dr. Harold Shipman um, was estimated to have had 250 victims. On January 31st, 2000, Shipman was found guilty of murdering 15 patients under his care. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with a whole life order. Shipman died by suicide by hanging himself in his cell. On the 13th of January 2004, he was aged 57. Over the years, a number of other inmates have also passed through the doors at HMP Wakefield. Ian Huntley, a school caretaker who murdered 10-year-old girls Holly Marie Wells and Jessica Amy Chapman, spent four years at the prison between 2004 and 2008. Robert Black, who kidnapped, raped and murdered four young girls between the age of 5 and 11, spent years at Monster Mansion. He was then transferred to another prison in Northern Ireland for the final two years of his life. Colin Island, who was known as the Gay Slayer, served time at the Wakefield facility after killing five men. He would meet his victims in gay clubs and lure them back to his house for sadomasochistic sex before murdering them. Now, as I mentioned, one of the other inmates who uh, is, you know, one of the UK's most uh, notorious inmates but he's he's one of the most loved by the public as well um, i've done a video about him before and I'll, I'll probably do another one um talking about his parole hearing his recent failed parole uh, attempt um but it was a story that has kind of shocked me a little bit really as in because everyone really loves charles bronson anyone who's in prison loves charles bronson um and you know if you've seen the film he's a very likable guy um you know to people he's not taking hostage <laughs> um but there's a chap come forward recently um, and the whole story was that this guy was Charles Bronson's son. Um, George Bambi, a self-proclaimed PR agent, has says he's uh, forged a relationship with Bronson after Britain's longest serving prisoner had seen him appear on TV. He said Bronson, who changed his name to Salvador in uh, 2014, had contacted him to help him promote himself and make sure that you know Bronson wasn't forgotten about. Mr. Bambi said he was banned from visiting Bronson in jail when he was outed as a journalist and claims that the pair cooked up a plan between them to pretend they were related. Speaking to Talk TV after Bronson lost his a, a parole board uh, bid for freedom, Mr. Bambi claimed that the cover-up had been the bane of his life. Mr. Bambi told Vanessa Feltz, Charles Bronson approached me six years ago while he saw a TV programme called Confessions of the Paparazzi. He realised I was really good with the media and he wanted me to get them on his side, to get in the papers, get loads of publicity for him and make sure that he wasn't forgotten about. And obviously try and expose what was going on inside the prison service. So I went to visit him and then I got banned from visiting him because they realised I was a journalist with a press pass and all the rest of it. So me and Charlie together made up the story that he was my dad. Charles Bronson is not my father. I am a PR agent. I'm a marketing person and I'm the UK's number one paparazzi, right? I've not told anyone this for six years, and it's been the absolute bane of my life, he continued. 
Me and Charlie for the last six years have made loads of money. We've had loads of fun. We've created loads of stories and we've done loads of ridiculous things. We've manipulated the media. We've manipulated the prison service. Bronson's brother, Mark Peterson, told the Daily Mail that he would never forgive him for trying to convince him that George was part of their family. Well, what a story. I mean, I even believe that. Um, the story was that apparently the one I heard was that Bronson had seen him on telly and basically thought that they were related. So he got him into the prison. Um, George was saying that he basically spat into a sandwich, um, then pulled out some of his mustache hair, shoved it in the span a sandwich and told him to take it home with him. Um, then they did a DNA test on the moustache and the spit and it turned out that they were 99% related. Um, so that, uh, you know, they must have been related. But it was just a PR stunt. Um, and it's possibly one of the reasons why, you know, Bronson has failed in a, another attempt to get released. Um, he's just a manipulative person who is constantly trying to get on the right side of everybody um, to be released. Um, but unfortunately, with the crimes he's committed, uh, his disregard for the law and the way he's treated the prison system and himself, um, I don't think he'll ever get out. As I mentioned before, a lot of the people in this prison, HMP Wakefield, they are either on whole life sentences or they're on life sentences where they will unlikely to be ever released. So they're likely to die in prison. It's a dirty, old Victorian prison with poor facilities. Um, the guys down on F-Wing and in the basement, you know, in the, in the extra cells, they don't even really get to see the light of day. It's conditions that you wouldn't treat an animal. But since we don't hang prisoners or give them the death penalty or ship them out to Australia anymore, um, prisons basically just become a holding ground until people die. Um, nobody really cares about them. There's, you know, not, not too many people are out protesting that, uh, you know, Robert Maudsley isn't getting the best life. Um, a lot of people think that this is what they deserve. Lock them up and throw away the key. But right now, while you're listening to this and while we're all living fairly relaxed and normal lives, someone, somewhere is locked away in a box in HMP Wakefield very much rightly deserved. A lot of these people don't deserve to ever see the light of day again. But still, we are in the UK in 2023 and there are people trapped in situations like the Tower of London where they're never going to see the day of light, the light of day again. And it's just quite a strange situation thinking that because you always think of, like I say, the Tower of London as being old and heinous and very medieval punishment but it's no different to what's happening today up in Wakefield. Now in some of my other videos I've been an advocate of basically getting inmates out of prison and putting them into the army. Me personally I would have felt like if after a certain amount of time if they'd come to me and said you know Bonnie do you want to go and fight in Afghanistan or in Iraq um, we'll put you on the front line you do a little bit of time in the army and then if you want to you can stay in the army or if not then you uh, you finish your sentence and, and leave. Um, I would have been quite happy to go and join the army. I think there's plenty of boys in prison that would quite happily go out there and uh, have a tear up. But what we've seen in the Russia-Ukraine conflict is the Wagner Group basically emptying the prisons on Russia's behalf and signing them all up and putting them in in the army. And we've seen some uh, you know some really bad atrocities caused by these inmates who. You know, they've got no loyalty to the army. Um, they're just out there to uh, basically do what they can get away with. Um, and that would happen on a mass scale, even with UK prisoners. So I now backtrack on what I said um, previously with uh, that statement of putting prisoners in the army. I think it would be a terrible idea. And can you imagine this lot when they get out there? Um, some of the crimes they commit, not only against the enemy, um, but, you know, some of them would be uh, eating the brains of... Uh, their own fellow man. Yeah, I think that's a really bad idea now, uh, putting <laughs> putting uh, criminals in the army, especially anyone from Wakefield. So in conclusion then, what's the answer? Do we go back to capital punishment? Um, a lot of people say, what if we get it wrong? What if you kill somebody and then find out they are innocent? 
lots of people still to this day um, are being found innocent of crimes they were committed to 40 years ago um, and it's suddenly come out that they were innocent all this time. Um, how many dead men would there be and women um, found out and you know justly found that they were not guilty. Then there's obviously people like Maudsley who were locked in a cell, beat someone to death, killed them, admitted to killing them. You know, is the world a better place without him? Who knows? Obviously, it's not us to judge, but uh, I know what my answer would be. I think that in a similar to the American system where you keep them in jail for 10 years, give them something really difficult to do, um, and then kill them at the end of it. Gas, hang, shoot, dogs, whatever. I think that's possible a way forward. But the UK has gone quite soft on this sort of thing. And... Uh, yeah, it's not much of a deterrent, is it? Living your life out in Monster Mansion with a, a bunch of other wrong -uns. I'd love to know what you think. And please let me know, obviously, what you think of the uh, the first episode. Um, you know, I've just dug around online and found as much as I could out about Wakefield without having been there myself. Um, I know that I've spoke, spoken to um, a prison officer in one of my other videos, and he was, uh, he was in a dispersal prison. Um, so it's interesting. If you want to go back and listen to his story, it was quite very, very interesting um, about some of the some of the inmates that he'd spent time with. Um, so yes, thank you very much for joining me for my first episode of the new season. Like, subscribe, tell your friends about it, and you will join me again on Wednesday when we'll be having William Bonney Weekly, and I'll be teaching people how to defend themselves in prison. Thank you very much. Cheers now. Bye-bye.